I am a man of my word. Even now, as I explain my plans to Kronklik, the look of confusion besetting his face shows doubt. But Tenna, what you're saying is madness. Is it even possible? Kronklik looks at me with those terrible eyes, the eyes of a hawk, inquisitive, ready to dissect me. Maybe, I say. The day's events have, ta have taken their toll on my body, and I'm tired, but determination pushes me forward. We must return to the village, see Father Bronin. I cough from the smoke lingering in the air as I enter the buggy. For the first time in months, I am grateful for its comfort. Soft plush seats of red, red velvet. With my back against the opposite door, I watch the remaining flames of my home burn into the sky. Already I am plagued by the images in my head. My beautiful Diana, her body burning away in the fire as I left her dead in the dirt. Her face crumbling to ash. I try to make sense of what happened, but sense has eluded me. Dorian, my son. And Joachim, my servant, are missing. I try to distract my mind, but it is impossible. I smell Diana's blood all over my hands and leather proofing. I, I begin to sob. I don't care if Kronklik hears. The pain is uncontrollable. My whole family torn asunder in a night. The crack of the whip sends the carriage into motion, shaking my senses. The conifers along the gravel road pass by as looming shadows in the sky. With the moon only half full, the limited light conceals the massacred bodies of the dead, servants out of its field. Eventually, my tears dry as red rivers across my face. I feel the caked blood and salt stiffen within the folds of my neck. The carriage ride is a temporary reprieve as Cronklick guides us into town. I stare at the lantern as it sways in rhythm with the galloping of horses, squeaking each bump. It reminds me of the caretakers, those skeletal frames I saw attacking the people of Roland. Evil souls possessed within bones, hunting for new bodies to claim. Those abominations never come into town. We are nearing Roland, Lord Wolfgang, says Kronklick in his formal address. I'm not sure the etiquette is necessary anymore, but I am too exhausted to argue. We rapidly approach the town, emerging from the darkness and into the bright red glow of burning buildings. The smell of smoldering wood and charred flesh stings my nostrils as I glare out the window. I sense a foreboding overcomes me when I see the damage done to Roland. Corpses lie in the street. Trees lie broken at the mast. Carriages have careened into fences. Town folk wander aimlessly about in shock. Some run to raging fires with spilling buckets. I see a couple, a woman holding her husband, crying over his tortured body. His legs are gone. I could remove myself from the carriage, go to her, comfort her, tell her I too have suffered the same. But the thought is pointless. She is lost within her own nightmare. Solemnly I observe a little boy pull at his sister's limp body, blood trailing from between her legs. I turn my head in disgust. What wrong had these people committed to deserve this? Did God abandon them, or did I fail in my duty? Deep in my stomach, a sudden pain rises with the thought that all of this suffering is because of me. Maybe I, tenor Alvadine Wolfgang, have somehow upset the natural order of things, slaying the monsters and beasts of the night. Maybe Diana's father was right. Maybe I've gone too far and this is retaliation, Mother Nature's way of restoring balance. I try to ignore the thought as we pass a dead man crushed by an overturned carriage, his chest ripped open, rats chewing on exposed rib bones. A hard thump nearly knocks me from the seat. Gripping the handles, I scramble to see what was hit. A man 
naked from head to toe, spins around in the street and then collapses. Kronklik, I call out. You just hit a man. It wasn't a man, he shouts from the top of his post. I assure you, he was already dead. More thumps follow and I brace my body to keep from sliding off the seat again. Instinctively, my hand goes to the boaca blade. The carriage comes to a halt and I peer out. A crowd of people, like crying angels, shout and bang on a nearby gate, calling out God's name for mercy. These must be the town folks who survived the onslaught of the vicious monsters. Some are bleeding profusely and others have barely a scratch. For a moment the scene is surreal to me, as if I were in some madhouse of crazed inmates. I look up to the sky and see a holy cross piercing the night sky, Albiston Church. The banging becomes louder, and the hysterical mob clangs on the wrought iron gates with shovels and pitchforks. They are seeking help from the church, but the gates are locked tight. A rusted chain prevents their advance. Where were the priests and clergymen? They were all here earlier. A full bearded man with axe in hand approaches my carriage. He places his bloody hands on the door and leans into the, ter into the interior. Hey, look, he shouts, waving his hand to the crowd behind him and pointing toward our arrival. Lord Wolfgang is here. Spit flies from his face as he talks. There are cuts all over his cheeks and forehead. Tell those holy fucks to, to let us in. We're going to die out here. For a moment, I am stunned. His eyes carry the faintest trace of red. The town folk seem to catch on to what's happening and surround the carriage. They begin shaking it as if to capsize a landlocked boat. My grip tightens around my blade, and any moment now, I will take this man's life. Con Cronkley calls from above. Looks like we're trapped, my lord. Is Cronkley being facetious? I raise my blade to separate the bearded man's hand from my carriage, when suddenly screams unfold from the crowd. The town folk burst into panic, trampling one another, as bogarts claw their way through flesh and bone. Their muscles are taut and the knobby joints allow them to move quickly. The familiar scent of human blood fills the air. Suddenly, everything is forgotten. The man with the axe runs to the aid of the others, as a woman just beyond my reach is raked by hellish claws. She falls to the earth with her back ripped open and an arm dismembered. God is not here. I emerge from the carriage, smashing a Bogart's head with the door in the process. Wood splinters, but I know Cronklick will fix it later. I descend like a billowing shade, mantle cracking behind me. I stand solitary, defiant, in a rain of blood and death. Three Bogarts surround me. They are quick, but I am faster. I lodge my... I step to the side, dislodging my blade. The Bowaka breaks free from the Bogart's face, spilling watery inwards onto my boots. I turn, cutting the other two with a mid-level strike, and their abdomen split. There is nothing left to support them, and they crumple. Just beyond, I see Kronklik firing his crossbow into a Bogart's forehead, just above its one and only eye. I nod to Kronklik, who has assured me the carriage is protected temporarily, so I continue my plan. In this fleeting moment, I am left with the image of Cronkley clubbing a Bogart with his cane. Each swing turns his gray suit red. Now the Bogarts are coming from every angle. I dare not look over my shoulder, ignoring the villagers' scream. I hear bones breaking, flesh rending. Dozens of Bogarts. They know me and are drawn to me like a moth to lichen. They are servants to the late Iglesian, the vampire lord I destroyed years ago. Why are they here? Who sent them? I must remain diligent and deliver them from this world. Making my way to the gate of the courtyard, a bogart approaches fast and my hand goes to my blade. The bearded man suddenly appears before me. Go! He screams, bringing his axe down on the monster, severing tendons in its neck, the eyeball bulging from its socket. To think I was going to cut this man's hand off, it's only a matter of time before he will die. So I make the best of his sacrifice and keep running, 
repairing stained nails and teeth. As I get closer, I notice something approaching the gate from the other side. A man wrapped in brown robes. It's impossible to tell which clergy member it is, but that's the least of my concerns. He carries a large ring with keys. Their metallic shine reflects the embers of burning buildings. He seems adamant to reach the gate, and so I press hard to meet him at the bars. The odds dwindle in my favor as I slash through more skin. More people die as the Bogarts continue their onslaught. For every two I cut down, five more appear. It's impossible to tell their source. Where were they coming from? A woman lies against the gate as I approach, still twitching with half of her neck missing. Shoving her aside, I check the lock on the bars and pull. The gate holds fast. Jingling keys bring my attention to the brown rat figure standing before me. I see only parts of him through the gate, his face wet with perspiration. Short locks of brown, warm brown eyes. Nestor. As he brings one of the keys to the lock, I grasp his wrist. His sodden face turns white, the look of a student caught in the act of misdeed. No, Nestor, I say, giving him a his hand a firm squeeze. There are too many. They will flood the gate. But my lord Wolfgang, father, the boy nearly drops the keys. I feel him shaking uncontrollably. Get a hold of yourself, I say with agitation. Nestor stares at me. Wait for my signal. A strong grip suddenly overcomes my shoulders and I am forced back. All I smell is the flesh of decay as I am extricated from the gate. I wait patiently as I am dragged across the cobblestones, supine, staring at the red clouds. If it weren't for my proofing, my body would be torn apart. A sagging eye and rotten teeth block the fire in the clouds from my vision. The bogart hovers over me like a vulture ready to pillage a prized carcass. My blade goes up through its teeth, peeling lips, twisting the buaca like a corkscrew and dislodging fragments of skull. No sound comes from its throat as I cast its body aside. Turning onto my side, I see the Bogarts coming from every direction. I roll to my feet and begin shouting the holy words of God, moving faster and faster away from the gate. My tactic works. I draw as much attention to me as possible, yet something isn't right. For a moment, I almost feel God's presence. Then, as before, the void where God should be is shockingly prominent. I look to the sky and feel the heat of burning buildings on my face. There are so many Bogarts. They swarm around me like a bees in a hive. I pray I distract them long enough for the carriage to make it through the gate once it's open. The first wave speeds towards me like dawn breaking over the horizon, single yellow orbs and sinewy bodies. They come at me at once with unforgiving hatred. I lose sight of the carriage and gate. The mighty cross atop Albuston Church is the only landmark emanating from the sea of monsters. I begin spinning my blade, letting four points rotate between each, twisting at the wrist. At first, my movements are easy. A long drawn swoop of my arm and a quick step slices the first wave to the ground. Dust from their papery skin lingers in clouds around me. More come and I feel the tension growing. They come from every direction, every angle, running, leaping. The seriousness of the situation reveals itself as I feel my own blood suddenly escape my leg. I pull back the bogart, sinking its claw into my leg, and lift its head up in front of me. With Bowaka in hand, I pierce its chest, twisting the blades. Bones splinter and I force, force it upward, dislodging the bogart's head. Ooze sprays my face, reminding me of, the, of Diana. Her blood, so warm and sweet, speckling my face, my Diana. The thought of her only increases my rage. I reach for a bogart, clawing at my back. I feel the scratching through the proofing. I swing it over my head and down onto the others. They fall on a clump of flesh, and three more replace them. Without a moment's pause, I flick the blade away from my body. It spins and curves, serving, severing arms and legs in its flight path. It boomerangs in a large outward loop and begins its return to me, temporarily weaponless. 
I reach for a stake at my hip and drive it into an approaching bogar, piercing upward through its mouth and the front portion of its head. It gurgles, collapsing to the floor as the balaka returns to me. For a moment, there is hope, a gap in the sea of monsters. I lunge for it, but instantly I'm intercepting. Somehow I am overpowered. Maybe it's the sheer number of dead, but I have been outnumbered far worse than this. Forced to the ground, my head jolts with pain. Although I can't see it, I am bleeding. Wetness soaks my hair. My vision is gone, blackened out from the impact. Yet I can hear the Bogarts all around, their horrid chattering teeth, the clicking of their jaws. Their breath is enough to make me vomit. Seems I am fated to be eaten by the Bogarts. God has strange ways of working with his tools. It's ironic a vampire hunter is to be slain by these lesser creatures. Fate is cruel. I try again to remove myself from the ground, but evil holds fast. Diana, my love. Dorian, my son. I have failed you both. Thank you.